kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here we go. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, oh, here we go. Good morning, Calvary Wallace. Will you do me a favor and just stand to your feet and just thank God. What an incredible morning we've had. Now, now, now go ahead and sit down because I'm going to do something I don't think I've ever done before. I'm getting ready to preach the shortest message I've ever preached. And let me, let me explain myself. I'm totally breaking protocol here, but I, I really just want to... Um, be sensitive to what I feel like God wants to do because as I was sitting there early and I was like, God, what in the world? I am messed up and I don't even know like what, I, what we're supposed to do with this and this is literally what I feel like the Lord said. He said, he said go ahead and share but, but today's flavor that we're dealing with, we're in this series, Fruit of the Spirit, nine flavors just coming from one fruit, Jesus. But he said, today's, just so you know, today's flavor is kindness. Everybody say Kindness. Just tell your neighbor you need a little more kindness in your life. Come on, tell a prophesy over him. But this is what I felt like the Lord said is share what you want to, but I'm not going to teach today on kindness. The Holy Spirit wants to show you kindness. And so I want to just, I'm going to give you my points today because some of y'all are like me and you're OCD. And if you don't get points, you leave here in hives. So I'm going I'm to share with you really briefly, but then I want to create space for the Holy Spirit and and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cut. If you're watching online, man, we welcome you today. Thank you for joining us. But I want to give room for the Holy Spirit to minister before we close out our time together today. So I'm going to do it a little bit different today. I'm going to share with you on kindness quickly, and then we'll move on. Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 32, because if you want to understand kindness, can I just say this? Kindness is not what you think it is, all right? Kindness, we are... Can I just tell you what I thought? I think of a kind person as somebody that kind of sits there, they're all nice and sweet and put together, kind of keep it their self, and they don't bother nobody, and ain't nobody bothering them. You know, they're just a kind person, somebody that's friendly. But as I studied this week what kindness is biblically, I realized that there's a lot more to it. Kindness is, is, is much less laid back than I thought it was. Kindness is, is expressed in how we care for others. So it, watch this. It's not just being nice to people, it's actually saying, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and get dirty in your mess because I care about you. And I want you to listen to this, listen to what Paul writes to Ephesians in in Ephesians 4.32, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, watch this, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And I love this because Paul couples together kindness and compassion. Now, let me just say, it is impossible to be kind without being compassionate. And my concern with the body of Christ is that we've learned how to be friendly, but not kind. And we lack compassion, and it's not because we don't care about others. It's because we have failed to identify with their pain. All right, let me explain. To be compassionate means... I don't just want you to get fixed, but I want to, I want to get, I, I'm willing to get involved in your mess. Are you with me? In other words, I, I'm not just showing up. Can I tell you right now what most of us feel like it's our, our duty as Christians is? It's to, whenever somebody's in trouble, we want to help them. So we show up da, 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 to save the day with our religion, to save the day with our solutions. And we fail to identify with the struggles that the person's in. So I show up with my solution, but I never identify with your pain. And can I tell you right now, sometimes you can be in a season of misery, of pain, and you really don't want somebody to tell you how to fix it. I don't want you to lead in, and it's not that I don't want to be fixed, but there's sometimes when you show up and you're spitting scripture at somebody who's going through a hurt, And the last thing they want is you to just tell them what they need to do. I am preaching, y'all. Where I just, you know, sometimes I just want somebody to come up and say, hey, tell me what's going on. 
I'm willing to listen. Help me understand what you're going through because I don't want you to go through it alone. And I may not even have the solution to your problem. Now, now watch this. Let me just say this. I'm not trying to be super spiritual. I know all of it's found in Jesus. But I may not have the strategy you're looking for to get you out of the mess you're in. But I will say this. I'll walk with you through it. I may not have the ability to clean it up for you. But I'll just tell you, while you're in the middle of it, you won't be by yourself. Because I may not know how to fix it. But I won't let you do it by yourself. Jesus, I mean, excuse me, God instructs a prophet named Ezekiel to go speak to his people. And I love this because the, the, the Bible says that God gives him a word to share with the people. And Ezekiel 3, I think it's around verse 15, the Bible says that he went down to the city and he sat where they were for seven days. And I read that and I go, wait a minute, why? Why is he not doing what God called him to do? Because God said, take this word to my people. But the Bible says that he went and he sat amongst them for seven days. And as I thought about that thing, Chad, I realized there's so much wisdom in how Ezekiel operated. Because he didn't just show up and go, thus saith the Lord, stop what you're doing. Put down your number two pencils. I have a word from you. You need to listen to what I got to say. The Bible says he went and he sat. He sat where they were. In other words, he wanted to relate to their issues. He wanted to experience their pain because it may change how he delivers the word of the Lord. Because sometimes you can show up and give the right information the wrong way and it's the wrong information. Sometimes you need to know that before people care how much you know, they need to know how much you care. And Ezekiel strategically places himself in the position of the people so that now he can identify with their pain so he can speak to it in the proper manner. Because there's a lot of things. How many of y'all know the, the word is like a two-edged sword? Yeah, Right? And sometimes we want to use it to cut people's ear off, Peter. Instead of actually using it for what it's meant to do. How many of y'all know if you cut their ear off, they can't hear you? Talk to me. And so, so, so Ezekiel operates with great wisdom. And I thought about it. I said, you know, it's interesting, Brother Ray, because Jesus did the same thing. Isn't it crazy, y'all, how Jesus, okay, Jesus, here's your assignment. Go change the world. And you're going to be on earth for 33 years. How many of y'all know if you had 33 years to change the world, you'd start working hard on day one? So why is it that Jesus waits 30 years before starting his ministry knowing he's only got a short timeline to accomplish what the Father sent him to do? Isn't it crazy that he's willing to mingle with us for 30 before he ministers to us for three? Why would Jesus just walk amongst us, sit where they sit for 30 years, the minister for three? Well, Hebrews tells us why. For we don't have a high priest that we can't identify with who has not faced the same things you and I have faced, but a, a high priest that can know exactly what my temptations are, know exactly what my struggles are, know exactly what my pain feels like so that now I can relate to him. Y'all know Jesus could have just shown up in day one and went, ta-da, it's all over. Let me fix it. But he didn't. Why? Because he wanted to be able to relate to us. He wanted to be able to have compassion. It's crazy, y'all. Think about it. Jesus is in ministry. He goes up and they let him know, hey, Lazarus died. Now, how many of y'all know Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead? Right? He told the disciples, hey, y'all, don't worry about it. He's just sleeping. They're like, well, if he's asleep, he'll be fine. He's like, yeah, it ain't quite like you think it is, but don't worry, he'll wake up. But the Bible says when he saw their, their grief, he wept. Why would Jesus, knowing the end of the story, weep in the middle of it? It's because he identified with their pain. He, he was compassionate. And if we're going to be kind, we must be compassionate. If you want to be intentionally, if you want to intentionally help others, you got to be willing to get in the middle of their mess. 
There are three ways that we can utilize or weaponize our kindness. Number one is this. We show kindness in our deeds. Can I just tell you right now? I'm wary of people that, that always talk but never walk. Where are married folks at? Married folks, how many of y'all know you can say I love you all day long, but if you never show it, come on somebody. I am so glad we are a ministry that is committed to not only the declaration of the gospel, but also the demonstration of the gospel. In other words, I'm not just gonna tell you, you know, that I love you. I'm gonna show you that I love you. For God so loved the world that he said, how many of y'all know that the love of God would hit a little different if you just read about it in the Bible, but you never experienced it. In other words, God, said, God tells me he loves me. But after a while, that might ring hollow. But now I have something to hang my hat on. Why? Because God loved me so much, he sent his son Jesus. He declared his love for me, and then he demonstrated his love for me. He didn't just do it in his words. He did it in his deeds. So that what that does is it validates what you say. I just want to ask you a question. When's the last time you did a good deed for somebody? When's the last time you showed your kindness in deed without expecting anything in return? You know what I've come to realize? It's real easy. Even in ministry, y'all, it's real easy to walk day in and day out and never be aware of opportunities we have to show our kindness. The second way we can express our kindness, watch this, is we can show kindness in our words. We can just call this show and tell. <laughs> All right? We show our kindness and then we tell you about kindness, right? Never underestimate the power of your words. I cannot count how many folks, grown church folk that I have sat with and they're struggling in their current stage of life because of words that were spoken over them decades ago. So see, I don't think we fully grasp just how powerful our words are. I know it's in scripture and I know we can recite it. The power of life and death lies in the tongue. But we really don't grasp just how powerful our words are. So I'm having conversations with people in their 40s who struggle with self-worth because when they were eight, they were told they'd never amount to nothing. And we think that our words don't matter? Do you realize how powerful your words are? Now the good news is that in the same token that that can be used for bad, it can also be used for good. So what if we were so intentional about our words to, to, to literally speak kindness into the life of others that we were intentional about having those conversations? What if in your marriage right now you started being intentional about speaking kindly to your spouse. What if you decided tomorrow to wake up and instead of just reminding your kids of everything they haven't done, you start telling them of everything who they are and start speaking kindness into their life. Kind words. Now watch this. Kind words are not always words that you want to hear. Sometimes they're words you need to hear. All right, let me say it like this. Clarity is kindness. It's unkind to you if I'm not clear about my expectations and then I hold you to a standard that I'm expecting that's never been expressed. A few months back, I was in a, a situation and I was like, man, I just really needed some advice. I was talking to Pastor Ben and he spoke those words. He said, man, you need to understand clarity is kindness. I said, what do you mean? He said, when you're clear with people, you're kind to people. He says, see, when you're not clear, you're unkind because you're creating a place that's really setting them up to fail because they don't know what it is you're expecting. See, you're frustrated in your marriage because your spouse isn't doing something you want them to do, but you've never taken the time to sit down and explain why it is you want them to do what you want them to do. And it's not kind to place expectations on somebody that's not properly expressed. It's not kind for me if I really love you and I want to be kind. So watch this. 
You can say nice things to people, but it not be kind. You may think it's not nice to tell somebody, hey, I'm concerned about this in your life. That may not be nice, but that's kind. Why? Because it may be an issue in their life that they need pointed out in love that will help keep them from falling into a trap that they're going to fall in weeks from now. Hey, I just want to tell you, you be careful. Well, what do you mean be careful? I am careful. No, 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 no. I just want to tell you, there may be some things you aren't seeing. And you don't think this is harmful, but I'm telling you, it's, it's got the potential to, to derail you. And that may, not, that may not feel like it's nice, but that's kind. Okay, let me ask you this. Let's, let's make it real. Imagine you go to your doctor's appointment and the doctor runs tests and he finds out you've got a, a, a medical condition. Let's just say cancer. I'm not putting that on you, Ricky Bobby, so don't get upset. <laughs> but let's just say, for instance, that the report comes back and the report says you got cancer, but the doctor goes, you know what? I, wanna be, I don't want to be mean. So I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to tell him everything looks good. And so he comes in the office and he goes, well, you know, we got the reports back and everything's great. And you, you know, well, what a nice thing to say. Now, is that kind? No. Because in a week when I'm throwing my guts up and I need to understand, I need to have some answers and you had the ability to tell me so that I could begin treating it or doing what I need to. That's not kind, right? It's the same way in any area of our life. Let me get, can I just help you out? You better have somebody in your life that has a green light to speak kindness to you, truth in love, even if it's not what you want to hear. Yeah, 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 good. It, it's not, it's, I'm not ever going to stand up here and say what the word of God doesn't say on purpose just because I want it to be nice because I don't want to upset anybody. I'm always going to speak the truth of the word and, and if it offends you, I'm sorry and I'm not doing it for the purpose of being offensive. But the truth sometimes may hurt, but we need to understand that the truth of God's word is literally given to us to protect us. Yeah. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. And it's not kind for me to pretend like something's not in the Bible and not, not be willing to tell you, tell you what's in the Bible. It's, that's not kind. That may be nice, right? But it may not be kind. And I, be, I want people who will speak kindness, who, will, who care about what I need to know whether or not I really want to hear it in that moment. Are y'all getting this? Now, again, it's done in love, and if it's done in love, you understand the heart behind it. So don't get upset when somebody, now that doesn't give you permission to just, now all of a sudden, you're not Holy Ghost. So you don't get to just go call out everybody's issues and say, well, I'm doing, I'm trying to be kind and point out how bad a person you are. No, you ain't kind, you're mean, you're rude, nobody likes you. There's a way to do it. If your heart's in the right place, are y'all getting this? So I speak, but, but I got to understand, I got to steward that, y'all. Watch this. How many of you guys in the last week punched somebody? Raise your hand. Put your hand down, Aiden. I'm just trying to help you, bro. Nobody. Now let me ask you another question. But how many of you, if you're really honest, there was one point in time in the last week where you wanted to punch somebody? My God, I love an honest church. Glory to God. I'm glad y'all were honest. I was going to preach online next week if you did. So can I ask you a question? If you felt like punching them, why didn't you do it? Because you showed restraint, right? Because you recognize that there would be consequences attached to you physically attacking somebody, right? In other words, you may have ended up in jail. You may have ended up in the hospital. You may have ended up divorced, <laughs> But you recognize that I need to, with, even though I really feel like letting them have it right now, I'm not going to do it while I'm going to show restraint because I recognize that it's not good for the situation. What if we use that same restraint with our words? Can I ask you another question? How many of you in the last month said something that you probably shouldn't have said and you wish you could go back and take it back. Okay, let me help you out. Let me get even more hands. Raise your second hand <laughs> if you've typed something in the last month. Put your hands down. Some of y'all ain't even wear deodorant today. You're like, you know. Okay. 
What if we were as intentional about showing constraint when it comes to our words, what we say, as we are about what we do? Would it change anything? Because the truth of the matter is we're, we're called to steward this thing. Can I tell you right now, there's some spiritual gifts that require development. But every born again believer is given a kindness kit. And all you got to do is simply be good to people. You know, you know, you don't have to learn how to be good to people. You actually just choose to do it. You don't, because watch this, I don't care how crazy you got during praise and worship. If when you go to the buffet this afternoon and you treat the waitress bad. And, and you're mad because your chicken's late. Knowing the only thing you got to do this afternoon is nap. And you're mad because you've been waiting a little while to be seated. So you're going to act like a fool and say something to a 19-year-old young lady who did show up to work today when other people didn't. Y'all ain't got to say amen, I'm going to preach. And you're going to treat them ugly because you've been inconvenienced. Or what if you decided today that I'm going to show kindness in my words and I'm going to say, hey, young lady, I just want you to know I'm thankful that you came into work today and I see you struggling and I know you're shorthanded and I saw the sign on the door and I'm sorry that there's some people and, and because of Sunday, most of them are church people. And I'm sorry that people are treating you like, but I just want you to know that I'm grateful for you. Wonder if, if that, that, that word of kindness would make a difference. Oh, now watch this. And I'm not just going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you kindness, that when I leave, I'm going to leave you a tip, even if my drink didn't get refilled as fast as I want it to be. I'm going to show you kindness. Because I have the ability to do that. Can I tell you right now, if you got saved yesterday, you can do that. Yeah, I don't, you might can't interpret tongues, but my God, you can hold yours. And I just wonder if we were as intentional about, about how we utilize our words with others as we were other things. See, stewardship in the kingdom is not just about what you do with your money. It's about what you do with your words and your deeds. The last thing is this quickly is, is not only can you show kindness in your deeds and show kindness in your words, watch this, you can sow kindness with your heart. What do I mean by that? Watch this. It's not just in what you do, it's in how you do it. It's the heart behind it. It's your motive, it's your why. One of the most incredible verses of all of scripture is found in Matthew 8. Now to set the stage real quick, in Matthew 8, Jesus comes up on a man who has leprosy. A leper. And he begins to minister to the man. And in Matthew 8 verse 3. I'm going to read to you. In Matthew 8. Jesus when he approaches him. The man says Lord. If you are willing. You can make me clean. He makes a petition to Jesus. And then this is incredible. because Now understand. Leprosy is the worst disease you'll find in the Bible. It's, it's like a, for, for us, it, modern day leprosy would almost be like AIDS. It was just, it was a deadly disease. And every time, it was so bad, in fact, that the Bible uses the typology of sin and unbelief. Horrible, it's a horrible disease. And this man comes up and says, hey, Lord, if you're willing, you can, you can make me clean. And, and, and listen to what Matthew 8, 3 says. It says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Now leave this verse up. Watch this. What makes this verse so amazing is not when Jesus said, I'm willing. It's not even when Jesus said, be clean. And watch this. It's not even when it says immediately he was cleansed. What makes this verse so incredible is it says Jesus reached out his hand and touch the man. Because it's the first time in your Bible that we ever see someone touch another person that has leprosy. Mm -hmm. 
I was reading an article this week as I was studying. I was like, leprosy, what is, what is this thing about? And I was reading this article and I didn't even realize this. But actually, the, in the early stages of leprosy, a person doesn't feel pain. And it said they can literally step on a nail and walk around with it in their foot and not know it. Because it attacks the nerve endings. And in this article, it was, there was a doctor named Dr. Brand. And Dr. Brand shared this story and he said, I was, I was getting ready to treat this young man in India who had leprosy. And he said, as I was standing there before the man with leprosy, along with the translator, I wanted to explain to him what the treatment was going to be like. So I placed my hand on his shoulder and I began to explain it and the translator was translating what I was saying. And he said, as I began to share with him what the treatment was going to look like, the man began crying out loud and shaking. And he said, my first thought is he must be afraid. So I turned to the translator and said, tell him he doesn't need to be scared. And the translator turns to him and he, he translates that. And then he hears back from the man and he turns to Dr. Brand and he says, he's not afraid. And Dr. Brand, confused, said, well, then why is he crying and shaking? And he turned back to Dr. Brandon and he said, because it's the first time in as long as he could remember that someone was willing to lay a hand on him. And it hit me like lepers in the Bible, their, their pain really wasn't physical pain. They didn't even, for the most part, didn't even feel the physical pain. There was torment involved with with their skin, but it was not, it was it wasn't the physical pain. It was the social rejection and the emotional anguish that they felt from being outcast and, and always pushed away. And Jesus doesn't just show kindness with his words, I am willing to be cleansed. He doesn't just show kindness with his deeds as he healed the man from his plight. He sowed kindness from his heart when he placed his hand on the man. And he said, you're accepted. You're, you're not damaged goods. Yeah, I know you got some issues. I'm not denying your issues. We'll deal with that in a minute. But you need to know that you're loved. You need to know that I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. You need to know that I'm willing to say, you know what, you're walking through this mess and I'm not afraid of your mess. Because my God is bigger than your mess. And I just wonder like. Sometimes in our. Authentic desires. To minister to people. With what we say and what we do. If sometimes we don't breeze right by. The how. And miss the opportunity to address the issue that's not seen. In other words, man, you get healed, we're going to celebrate. When I share God's promises with you, you ought to lift your hands and get excited. But I also want you to know that while you're in the middle of this mess, you're not in it by yourself. And your issue doesn't stop me from climbing down in your pit. You know, there's some times where God absolutely just delivers us out of stuff. And I thank God for it. But there's some times when he'll let you sleep all night in the den of the lion. And he won't bring you out of it, but he'll climb in there with you. And I just wonder if sometimes the greatest ministry we could provide is being willing to go where they are. Yeah. You know, it's become the culture of Christians to say, oh, I'll pray for you, or I'll pray about it. I'll keep you lifted up. And thank God for that. Like I believe in prayer. I believe in intercessory prayer. I believe in, 
and being willing to stand in the gap and declare and come in agreement with God's word and promises for people's lives. But I just wonder if sometimes it just wouldn't be best if we'd just be willing to come down off of where we are and just say, hey, I don't know, Logan, what the solution to your problem is. And I'm not even sure how you're going to make it through, but I just want you to know that while you're in it, you won't be by yourself. And you know, it's not always easy. Like, it's much cleaner and safer for me to say, I'll pray for you. But I just got to think that sometimes it's more effective for me to say, yeah, but sometimes you just need somebody with you. And I just need you to know that like what you're going through, I may, maybe I've never been through. But whatever it is, God's got you. But in the middle of your process, I'll walk with you through it. Now don't expect me to be Jesus because I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I'm not telling you I'm here to fix it, but I'm telling you that I'm willing to walk with you while he does. Like, I just wonder, y'all, if that's like, if that's not really what building the kingdom is. Like, what if this afternoon when you went home, instead of just prescribing to your teenager what they need to do, you entered their world. And you said, hey, hey, come, come tell me about what's going on. Not so I can fix it, but so I can relate to you. So that I can walk with you through this. Not just give you 10 steps to get out of it. And the reason that's so important, y'all, is not just because we get to be the hands and feet of Christ and express kindness. It's because if we aren't careful in our desire to give good advice, then we become nothing more than a handbook for people to read. Like, man, I'm, I'm thankful for principles. I'm thankful that I have parents that when I find myself in issues, they can offer advice and say, hey, you maybe ought to look at it and do it this way. I'm very grateful for that. But I'm even more grateful when they're willing to say, hey, what's going on? And, and as I'm crying and, and going, I don't understand that they may not have answers, but they're willing to just sit there and go, yeah, I don't know, but you just need to know you're loved. You just need to know you're not by yourself. Man, it'd be nice if I could fix everybody's problems, but I can't. But just because I can't fix your problem doesn't mean it's not my problem. And I think sometimes the greatest way we can sow kindness is by simply saying, I'll take the journey with you. Can I just help you for a moment? Stop putting pressure on yourself to have every solution. People don't like to hear this, but Jesus didn't even know everything. Huh. Don't get mad at me. He said, I don't even know. You ask me questions, he's like, only the Father knows some of the stuff. But he didn't say, Oh, okay, well, because I don't have the solution, that's not my problem. He identified with where they were at. said, hey, I'll meet you in your confusion. I'll walk with you through your storm. I'll process with you through your pain. And at the end of the day, that's, I believe that's what we're called to do. So this is how I want to end service. I want to just do this. I'm going to pray over you, and then I want to open up the altar down front. And if you have a ministry need, I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to ask some of our, our leaders and elders if they would just be available. And, and we'll pray with you, whatever it is. Maybe it's a physical need. Maybe it's a relational issue. Maybe it's a financial struggle you're in. Whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's a, an emotional deal that you're wrestling with. But here's what I want you to know. We know Jesus is, is the ultimate solution, but I'm not asking myself or any of our leaders to have strategy. I just want you to know that we're just going to say, hey, We'll walk with you through it.
And let's just minister kindness. And maybe you're not in that place. Maybe you're in a season where things are good. And maybe you need to be the one that sows kindness to somebody else. And says, hey, I don't know what you're going through, but I just want you to know that if you need me, I'm here. And I, I might can't fix your problem, but I can't walk with you through it. So just stand your feet all over the building. I want to pray over you, and I'll, I'll release you. And then if you want to come down front for ministry, we'll be available. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. Your word pairs, God, your goodness and your kindness. And it's your goodness that's your glory. When Moses asked to see your glory, you said, your word says that your goodness passed before him. God, and my prayer is that we would just see the goodness of God and have the eyes of our heart opened up to recognize the plight of others. To be able to see opportunities to sow kindness with our deeds, with our words, and with our hearts. Not just in what we say or what we do, but in how we do it. To be able to sit where others sit and identify with their pain so that we can be burden bearers to walk along with them and say, you know what, I might can't take it away, but I can lighten the load because I'll walk with you through it. Just to be able for them to know, God, that they're not alone. Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would use this opportunity, even in the moments we have together for ministry, to speak to the deepest chasms of our souls and remind us that every need we have has already been met according to our riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That every disease and sickness has been healed. That all provision has already been provided that you have made ways where there are no ways. And that Holy Spirit, as you minister to us and we minister through, you minister through us and to us, that these promises of God become so tangible and real, manifesting in our midst to the place where we get to experience that goodness that shows up in every single situation so that you, Jesus, receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. The down front area is open for ministry time. The rest of you love you. God bless you. Have a great weekend. See you next Sunday.